Hello, my name is Davinia Khan and I'm from Fresh Arts. This project is called Children of the Windrush Generation. The Windrush Generation refers to people who came to the UK from the Caribbean between the years of 1948 and 1970. These people were invited to come to the UK to rebuild the country after World War II. This project tells the story of seven people who came to the UK between the ages of six and 13. We'll hear all about their journey, their triumphs and the challenges that they faced. We hope that you enjoy this project. My name is Fitzroy Lloyd Anson. I'm, I'm 70, born on the 25th of March, 1951. My name is Godfrey Anderson. Um, many people know me as Paul which is a nickname I was given in Jamaica, as many of us were. I was born in 1958 and I came to England when I was uh, around seven years old. My name is Marcia Burke. I was born in St Thomas in Jamaica in May 1959. My name's Pauline Josephine Wedderburn and I was born on the 2nd of August 1960 at St Andrew's Hospital in Kingston, Jamaica. My name is Marie Angela Anderson. I was born in Jamaica on the 2nd of October 1951. My full name is Beverly Goddard Brown. I was born in Jamaica in 1959 in Fontill, St. Thomas. I'm Winsome Johnson. I was born in 1959 in Jamaica, Kingston. I live a pretty... Um, it was... I mean, first of all, when I was younger, like, yeah, like when, I w when my mom leave Jamaica and leave us in Jamaica and come to England, I had to move to the countryside of Jamaica and live with my aunt, beautiful lady. She's one of the people that help the whole community. She, if, any ch if any child in the community ever needed... Um, like looking after or help, she would want to, she'd be the first one to want to help them, take them in. That's, you know, she look after so many children. Where we lived, there was no electricity, there was no running water. Um, we live in a tiny little house. We depend on the rain to, to use the rain water for everything, for washing, cooking, everything like that. Um, I didn't have toys or television to watch or anything like that, so I used to play mainly with... I used to go out and see the birds first thing in the morning, see when, what they're doing when they go out to, to get food for their little babies and watch them coming back with the food, watch them feeding them, just nature itself. That's, that's what used to entertain me. I'm a country boy. I'm so from the country, a real country. So we were like, there not many cars, and there was just one bus maybe every couple of days. The school I went to is a school called Bethelza School. And apart from going to school and coming home, we now have um, chores that we can look after pigs, goats, cows. We, we have animals, and that was my chores to look after them after school. And that was basically it. We had to, I had to work like a big man at the age of nine, ten years old. Right, my life in Jamaica was somewhat Id idyllic in, in terms of the limited memory that I have of it. Um, what I do know is that it was um, basically growing up with my um, aunt and, and uncle who, as my parents had left to come to the, the UK uh, to, to seek a better life. Um, so I, I have no recollection of them as a very young child. I just remember my aunt and uncle, and in particular my uncle, who um, treated me very well, almost as a, almost as a like a prince. Um, and you know, I, I remember being uh, in a situation where, when a horse gave birth to a foal, it was mine. When a cow gave birth to a calf, it was mine. You know, having dogs, um, you know, animals, going to market, you know, with my aunt. Um, 
after they harvested pimento and this kind of stuff, going to market in Kingston, the capital of Jamaica. Um, just lots of great things, you know, spending lots of time outside with my brothers and, and my sister and cousins and so on. So my life in Jamaica, was, as, a, as a very young boy, was quite idyllic. Uh, my grandma was fat and she had heavy hands, so she slept, you remember this. <laughs> Uh, she was lovely. She was she was funny. She was very wholesome. I mean, you know, she did a lot of things well. She was a great cook, um, and yeah, she was funny. She just used to she you you could have a good laugh with her. She had a great sense of humour. Uh, I think my favourite thing was um, going shopping because she used to go to the market. She used to do have a market day. Not necessarily every weekend, but she'd go to the market from time to time. And when I did go to the market with her, it's like shopping day. So um, we'd sell in the market, but she would take me shopping to buy me some clothes. My, my nan, my gran, she, you know, she was such a lovely, a lovely person. So she make us, make, when my mum went, she made us home stay the same, you know, so. I did miss my mum coming, but we keep getting letters and so, you know, and she sent us clothes and stuff like that. So we were really in this big tenement yard wearing all these England clothes, <laughs> you know. So we, with her coming, it did provide a better life for us because my mum was a single, was a single mother. Mm. What you call, you know, they, we didn't have a single mum then, but that's what we call it now. But my mum and dad weren't together. And so it was just us four, my aunt and my brother and my mum. So my mum always worked, but she said, you know, to give us a better life and because of where we were living as well, she wanted us to have a better life and to sort of move away from this tenement yard and have something for herself, you know. So um, she said to my, to my grand then that she's going to come to London, but she was only going to come for five years, three to five years, so she could save save hard and go back home and build a nice life for us out in Jamaica, not here, not here. When I left Jamaica for the airport, I mean, they didn't tell me I was actually coming here. So this was my, um, this was my um, ticket, which is a VOAC ticket. And um, it sort of shows uh, a, passenger, a young passenger traveling alone. Now, I felt I was traveling alone. I know they had aerostess on there to look after me, but I, I didn't feel they didn't, they, they, they didn't do their job. They might have stopped me from running off or ending up in another country, but I wasn't even aware that they were there looking after me. I mean, it's only when I actually got on the plane, I realized I was coming and my grandmother wasn't coming with me. I didn't mind going on the plane because of course it was excited, you want to get on the plane. But then she didn't come through the other door. And I was, you know, that left a bad taste in my mouth. The journey, it was like, I, all that I remember was that I went to the, to the airport. Then it was called Pal Palisades Airport. And we were driven there by one of my aunt's friends. And then it was a group of us, a group of, uh, of boys and girls going, because we were called a company minor. There's a group. So we had this big placard runner there with our name and my, and my mum's name on it. And then the stewardess then, we call them stewardess then, they, they looked after us. I really, too, truly, I just was so excited getting on a plane, you know? I mean, we didn't up and we just sat there, you know, and they gave us like coloring books and stuff, you know, but I didn't do anything like that. I was just excited that I'm coming to see my mum and I'm on a plane coming. Even when I got off the plane, I didn't like what I see because it, was, it wasn't what I was expecting. I thought I was going to be stepping in to a Cinderella kind of scenario. I thought there was going to be a white carriage. I thought there was going to be like, you know, I thought it was going to be snowing all the time. I thought that England was going to be white. I expected it to be white. I was expecting to kind of live in Buckingham Palace or somewhere like that. I mean, I was really expecting big things. I mean, really.
I mean, I thought we really had, you know, like a chauffeur would be, we'd be having a different chauffeur every week. I mean, that sort of grandeur was in my head. I was told lots of stories about this country, about how, you know, it's paved with gold and, you know, it's just, it's a wonderful life to be in England. I just was told nice stories about the country all the time. So they have a queen and you just always think, yeah, you might meet the Queen if you come to England. You think you see a lot of the Queen and stuff like that. Yeah, just stories that like that make you feel warm to come. You know, you want to know what it's all about. You know, but my aunt used to say it's not what 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 is what they're saying. It's not really. You don't know until you actually go there. I could. I never really imagine. Couldn't imagine where England was at my, at my age. I just see England. I never have no preconceived um, idea where it was. I know them say it was cool and dark, and that was it. And when I came, I saw it was cool and dark for real. I was picked up from the Heathrow, from the Heathrow airport, you think it was, by my mum and um, you know, Uncle Evans. My mum, Uncle Evans, and my dad. And it was freezing cold, freezing October. And um, I was driving from the airport in the car, everything seemed so strange. All these houses and smoke coming out of the town, the chimneys. Never seen chimneys, but like a Jamaica, everything is a, is a, like is a open. We just we don't wear jumpers and clothes. We just shorts and t-shirt. Driving all the way down, the place looks so strange. All the houses joined up together. In Jamaica, every house is an individual house, isn't it? And I said, to my, what else? They look like barracks, like they're soldiers' barracks. I said, no, that's the houses. I said, is it? Back then, people believed in England as a mother country. You know, the streets were paved with gold, and so. There was this belief, and of course, people who lived here didn't didn't um, break that illusion, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to say to people, "Don't come," you know. So they came because they thought they would be welcomed. Of course, it was a total opposite story. They weren't welcomed, and um, uh, so I I don't know if the decision, if they consciously thought about it, but they weren't in a position necessarily. To, to go back and uh, and I think as well, it was whatever sacrifices they made, they made it in the hope that their children would have a better future. That's what I, you know, that's what I think why maybe they stayed as well. My memory of primary school, when I came, I had a very strong Jamaican accent and both the black and the white children teased me terribly because of my accent. And, but I, I, <laughs> I, I didn't take no nonsense. The amount of fights I got into because I really didn't take no nonsense and I fought back. And there was one occasion, I won't mention his name. <laughs> I think I even remember his name up to this day, but after, after feet, I used to actually get the better of them, boys as well, I used to get the better of them. But anyway, on this occasion, the teacher told him to apologize. And so he did apologize and he, he got me this ring. I think it's only like, you know, costume, it wasn't anything valuable, but I took it home and my mom said, oh, what'd you get that from? So I said to her, she said, give it back. She said, you cannot buy friendship. So I had to give him back his ring. And I never liked school. And it was all the boys called them and and all that, them little white boys. My first day of school, when I went there, like, I, I was in the playground, didn't know anyone. You know, you, you, the parents took to school, playtime, everybody was running around kicking football. I was just standing there looking around. I remember this white boy, this white boy came. He comes out, are you a new boy here? I say, <laughs> nervously. And he stepped back and he looked at me, <laughs> spit right in my face. And I'm like, a man full of spit. I look at the size of him and I couldn't do nothing about it. And I took a ride in it. But um, that, that kind of man, it was a sh culture shock. Mm -hmm. And I see him every day when we the playground, but he was such a bigger guy than me. I couldn't do nothing. But, but I catch up with him though. Six months later, about three months later, I catch up with him. I mean, I, I deal with him. When I was living in Nottingham, because obviously I went to school in Nottingham, and where we lived in Nottingham, we just lived around the corner from Sherwood Forest. And my school was like two or three minutes away on um, walk. 
Um, it was a nice school. I, I kind of enjoyed it, you know. I remember the Christmas carols and it's so different in Nottingham. Um, the lifestyle in Nottingham is completely different from London. It's very, in those days, it's very slow paced. Everything was kind of different, but the people were nice. You know, they were nice, whether they were white or black or whatever, they were nice people. The school was nice, it was, you know, um, but I do remember stuck in my head that I had this fight with this girl, young girl. I don't know if she called me something derogatory. <clears throat> I don't know if it was something to do with my colour or what it was. All I can remember is that me and her was rolling down this hill from the school. Um, and then obviously my aunt came up. But um, other than that, school was OK. And, and then I moved to London and I went to school in London. I used to like the food. <laughs> I remember the milk and the cheesy biscuits and stuff like that that we had. Because we used to have the gold top milk and silver top milk as children, you know, in the bottles at the time. Um, I didn't really like the, the, the gold top, but yeah, that's what we used to get. As In those days, you used to get a bottle of milk in, in the morning as children and you used to get biscuits, you know. That doesn't happen any, anymore, but that's how it was, you know. And the school dinners, I used to like the school dinners. So even though I was Jamaican, I did start enjoying the school dinners because that school dinners, that, that school was lovely, all the pies and stuff. And um, yeah, um, it was a nice school. School was, it was a bit of trying to, it's getting too used to it. I mean, the child, some of the children were real bullies. Um, and I had to literally get into fights, not because I wanted to, but basically to defend myself because there was a lot of, troublesome children in the school. There were quite a few children there that would harass you for no good reason. So, I, d I mean, the school, school, I mean, that was mild. It was okay. It was okay for the first few years. Yeah, it was okay. Everyone sort of gravitated towards the comprehensive thinking it was a good thing. I'm not so sure. Um, it was, it was too big and we didn't get, we didn't get the, the attention that we needed. We were just thrown in the deep end, I think, because with the comprehensive, everything was moving so fast. They didn't really think about the children. They, you, you know, you just had to fit into a box. It wasn't really, and every, the decision was made, you didn't have a, Part, you know, it's like pre-planning made on your behalf. You didn't have nothing to do with it. I went to Chesterfield House where the, you had to do a test. And the test that you had to do was, um, was rigorous because they, they, they gave me science, um, everything, English, the whole, everything, you know, so many tests. But each time I, I complete the test and I was sitting, waiting outside for my results, I noticed they come, they come out with other people and staring at me and I was thinking, what have I done? Why are they looking at me? And they said, do you mind, um, can, I know you've completed the test, but would you mind doing a few more tests for us? So they was asking me to go back in and do extra tests. And then when they called me back in to do the extra test, I would complete them in no time and go back and sit out there. And then when they explained to my mom what, what it was, they said, um, she is amazing, the, her, you know, she is high. She's very bright, very, very, very bright. So they said, um, but we haven't got a school at the moment that can cater for her kind of, you know, intelligence and things like that. But there's one school that, that have, um, you can, in the area that, you know, we'll put her in the highest class. I didn't really understand a lot of things at school. So I'd be, I'd muck about, I'd be, one of those kids who'd be crawling around on the floor under the desks and and in those days teachers would be quite happy to let you just do that sort of thing so they get on with the other kids you know yeah on one occasion i was crawling under the table in the class and mrs smith the head teacher came in to speak with the class teacher and she spotted me and then she said to me, right, go and sit outside my office. So I went and sat outside her office. And when she came back, she got out books and papers and asked, you know, showed me various things and asked me lots of questions. After which she determined and, and said, I think you're a very clever boy and you need to be in a, in a, in a better class. Um, and she put the, then put me into the highest streamed 
class for that year? I was in the class for a few months, um, keeping up with all the work, because the headmaster, I asked him when he, he came to my class one day to, to, to um, put it from the beginning, and he just said to me, because there was no other like black children in the class that I was put in, so I wasn't, I was the only black child in my, all my lessons that I went to, all the lessons I, I, I went to was just, I didn't thought there was any black kids in that school actually because I didn't see them at playtime or anything like that, or see them any time. So I, um, I just thought that it was just me and these children in the whole school. And, um, and then one day he came to my class and just said to me, um, um, I'd like to talk to you. Um, I think there's another class I would like to put you in that I think you'll feel more comfortable in. I said, I said, but am I keeping up with my work in this class? I haven't done anything wrong, have I ever? He said, oh, not at all, not at all. You haven't done a thing wrong. Nothing wrong. You're keeping up with the work, OK? Don't worry, the class you're going to, you'll be able to still keep up with the same work. Don't worry about it, don't worry. You know, just, just that I think you'll feel better in another class, you know? So I said, but I'm, I'm telling you, I'm feeling fine in this class. I'm all right. I've got my friends here. I, I talked to the, you know, because the children treated me fine. They used to, I used to show them an easier way to do their sums on, and do other things. And they, they all used to crowd around me because the teacher might show them one way. And I'm saying, well, this way you could get it done quicker. Or, the, you know, and I used to get on with, with, you know, with the other children in the class. So couldn't understand what he meant by I'll be happier. So when he took me to this class now, and um, I looked, I didn't see any white children in that class. One, yeah, there was one, one white, white, white boy in the class, one, yeah. So I didn't see any, any other though. No, no one else, it just was, there was a lot of um, Indian children and black children, yeah. So we didn't have any, any, you know, so it was like that. And then, but that wasn't the factor though. I thought it was nice to see, some of the people even speak like me. I was was quite happy seeing them. It was really nice, you know, seeing that there was people like me within the school. But the only problem with that, when they when I sort of been to go to the lesson and they're teaching the lesson now, I said I said to the teacher, I said, sorry, sir, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but I said I done this when I was four years old. What you're teaching? And that's not a lie, it's the honest to God truth. I'd done what he was teaching us when I was four. So I said, how could you get away with teaching this to grown people? These people, are, these are big children. They shouldn't be learning this now. They should have done this when they was four. I couldn't understand why he's teaching one on one, make two and whatever. It was just basic things. My parents didn't tell me anything about racism. They didn't have a uh, issue you know there wasn't that we didn't have that sort of conversation at home and and I didn't have I mean I didn't have I mean it was say white people at the time but I didn't have any preconceived ideas about white people if you understand what I'm saying I didn't my, my parents didn't say oh don't trust those people because they're I didn't, I mean, I find they, they were, they were gentle. They were, you know, they spoke softer than we did. And to be quite honest, I think I, I suffered more with, I mean, I never got into a fight with a white person. I mean, no white person was waiting for me after school to beat me up. It's always the black kids. So I don't, I don't, it's the black kids that was beating me up or trying to beat me up. So that, so, that wasn't it. But then I noticed that obviously it's the teachers and how the classes were set out. We, but it wasn't something that we could have controlled. But obviously we were placed in a situation where obviously, you know, as if you don't notice, because obviously how the classes were set up, you see that the black kids were put in one class and the white kids were put in another class. So, you know, it was like, yeah. And the, what they were taught, we weren't taught the same thing. They had a different, they had, what they were taught, when you looked at their blackboards, it's like they've been taught something. When you look at your blackboard, think, what the hell? You didn't get, I didn't, in my class, they didn't give us homework. For me personally, um, 
I think I might have encountered racism maybe twice during like maybe my teenage years. Um, I heard about it and I've had people, you know, I've heard people talking about things happening. Me personally having it, I can only remember one um, episode when I was going to um, King Edwards, it's called, I think, it's King Edwards Park. And when I was walking to go to the park, this white boy, I think he, I don't know if he called me a or something like that. And I think that was the first time, even in my work life, I've not encountered it that people have called me like names or anything um, because of my color, apart from one job that I felt it was my color because I was more um, experienced than the person who got the job, right? And even the white supervisor who, when we both went for the job, said to me, I don't understand how, that, how she get that job because you should have got that job. And the reason I think it was racial because it was a government job it was a face, a front facing job where um, members of parliament would come in, you have to greet them and stuff like that. She was blonde and blue eyed. And I just felt they don't want a black face in there, you know, kind of thing. And we were a little bit of a novelty because <laughs> uh, we came from Jamaica and went to middle school. Uh, I think that was from the age of about 11 to 13. And uh, one of the memories I have was the English teacher saying to me, oh, you speak very good English. Was you born in this country? I said, no, <laughs> I was born in Jamaica. But it, again, it kind of shows you the ignorance, kind of thinking, well, what language do you think people speak in Jamaica? When I used to call up for, to, to, for work, for jobs, and I would call and they would say, uh, you know, I'll try to put on a, you know, as posh as I can speak, but they still could pick up on the little accent there and they would go, oh, I'm so sorry, we already have a Jamaican um, working here already. <laughs> we already have a Jamaican working here. Oh my goodness, they usually say things like that when you call up for the jobs and things like that. Or um, I would manage to get myself through to go for an interview. And they didn't know that, you know, like who would they come in for this interview. I would turn up to the interview and as soon as they clock me, it's like, it's all a turmoil. Everyone looking all flustered and funny and like they, they want to say, sorry, we can't do this interview. But I never, I go in the interview and it's like, it doesn't last very long. We don't want to really waste your time here. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't think this job would be, you know, you know suitable really and you know and they would just like try and put it as politely as they can or uh, i will get back to you you know but you don't have the interview again once they see you face to face so that's the sort of challenges i had with um working and things like that it was really really strange really strange you speak to them on the phone they talk to you nice you know looking forward to meeting you you turn up and that's what you get yeah my dad always used to say um, it's a bit like, you know, if you're going to get anywhere as a black person, even as a black child in school, you, you have to be the best. You can't just be average or, you know, be a wallflower. You've got to, so he would always say, if the teacher asks you a question, make sure you put up your hand, you put up your hand. And so I, I was very, it was quite easy for me to be very vocal. <laughs> I left school, um, my first job was in Parkwell, working in a factory, in terms of was manufacturing work, and then working in an um, engineering, comp engineering company, and then um, capstone operating, making tools, of some machine tools. It was hard work, and it was like piece work. The more you do, the more you earn. Uh, <clears throat> I did a fellow while, and I did quite a few jobs. At them times, you could, you could get a job easy. You walk out of one job and walk out the next one. My mom used to say, when, when I came, she used to say, oh, you're like, it's like two women living in this house, even though you're, you know, because I turned 13 like a few months after coming here. She goes, even though you're just 13 years old, you're like another woman in the house because you know how to wash, you know how to cook, you know how to do everything, you know? So she said, because she would go shopping and come back, her front door would be a different color. 
yeah the um the kitchen will be painted a different you know differently and beautiful as well because i know how to do everything as a teenager um it was more going out love to go out love music love to, i used to buy a lot of records and i think i got that um inherited that from my dad and so i grew up on James Brown music, <laughs> dare I even say it, Jim Reeves. But um, my teenage days was the era of Lovers Rock. And so Janet Kay, you know, I think that's the first, her Silly Games, I think that's probably one of the first songs I learned heart, you know, word for word. And um, it's quite funny, you don't realise things that you do, but when I wasn't feeling happy or you know, miserable about something, I would actually go into our front room and my dad had his music system up and I would play his music, but all the sort of sweet soul music, sort of wallowing. But my mum always realised, because she used to say to my dad, Paul, go talk to your daughter, because she realised something was obviously bothering me. I went to do short and then typing at the school here, it was still here, Buckingham, and Mrs. Griffin, and they used to go there twice a week to do short and typing, you know, so after I left school, that's where it started, got my first office job and haven't looked back since. It was a house like this, okay. exactly a house like this, and there's um, two rooms, and one was for first stage and one was for advanced and she was very strict she was from she was, a, she was a white lady but she's like she's come from old school and she had this her hair was always up in a bun and she walks with a ruler and if she sees because she sees you looking at the keyboard that you shouldn't look she'd hit you on the you know not in a horrible way but you know because it should be covered but sometimes you have to just ease it over to have a look to see what key you're on you know and then we did um, short end as well. I went there for, for quite a while. Uh, one of the few things I remember my dad actually doing for me, for me personally, he signed me up, he took me to, to Chiswick and we, um, and we joined the a drama school, the Fieldine Stage School, who at the time was quite a, a, a good stage school. A lot of people on telly were at this stage school. And I used to go on a Saturday with my friend Gina. <laughs> and we used to meet up and get in the bus and go and do stage school. So I, that's what I got into. And I also did uh, a few bits and pieces. I got a job. Uh, one of the most notable jobs that I got was a play of the BBC Play of the Month, Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. The star of that was Maggie Smith, who's now Dame Maggie Smith. Um, and a, a, a wealth of big stars who were in it, and I was her servant. <laughs> I used to follow her around all over the place. I think what that you need a community. We didn't have that. You know, we, we, I think we made our own community. But it's nice to know if you got, um, say, right, I'm from... Um, Jamaica, I'm from Barbados, can we have some of that? The, and exchange, exchange how they feel, whatever, instead of just come being on their own or with their parents or just stuck in the school that, that they don't know anyone. But I think for me, because a lot of the kids, as I said, are from the Caribbean, so we sort of mix in them. But I don't think it's happening now, so I thought that's what will be needed. If you can't achieve anything, if you feel you want to achieve it, you have to be strong. You have to be strong. You can, because if I should have been more persistent, I, I, I do believe I, should, I, I wasn't as persistent as I should. I was with Maria, I said, more persistent with my career. And I maybe could have been better. But I think be more persistent and be yourself and be confident. I think that, that counts for a lot. A, a lot of people get, get, get knocked back and just say, I can't be better. Yeah, I would just say, really, be yourself. Don't give up. Don't, no one's better than you. No, you know, everything comes back around. If you're, if you're black, it comes in fashion. If you're tall, it comes back in fashion. If you're skinny, it comes in fashion. If you're fat, it comes in fashion. 
don't give up, don't worry about anybody else, you know, because you just have to just be yourself because that's really what matters at the end of the day. You just really be yourself. Be, you know, find yourself first before you try to be like anybody. Don't try to be like anybody else. You can admire them, but you are, will, and you will always be you. You can only be the best of yourself. You can't be the best of anybody else, you know you have what it takes. Because I used to think, well, oh, this person is better than me and everybody's better than me. And nobody's better than you because you just don't know what you can do until you do it. Mm -hmm. And if you've never had the opportunity to do something, you can't be as good as somebody else if you've never been exposed to that. So, you know, and all you do, don't give up. You just keep trying and you really are, you, you, you know, you've only got yourself to rely on at the end of the day. and. Yeah, you're, you're, you're not that bad. <laughs> That's all I can say, really. And, you know, just, just have some, just, just believe in yourself. Just take, just know that you're worthy. You're just as good as anybody else.